study tips. So, um, what we want to investigate here is, why is it difficult to learn programming? A few of beginner's misconceptions. Uh, we would like to emphasize yet again that it, uh, that people need to practice in, in order to acquire skills. Um, then, um, another idea is that you should ask for help any, uh, uh, any time you think uh, that you're lagging behind. And, and there's things to clarify for yourself. Don't just be shy and wait for things to accumulate. And uh, finally, a little bit of, uh, about learning uh, by association, which is one um, type of learning that will be uh, emphasized um, uh, a lot during this uh, morning. So, why is it difficult to learn programming? Um, so, programming uh, is a process that, that proceeds in two phases, right? There's a problem-solving phase, and there's uh, a second phase of expressing uh, the solution into a language. Um, and uh, the, one of the problems, one of the difficulties, uh, and one of the aspects that is uh, terribly overlooked in teaching programming is this separation and the fact that expressing the solution to a language requires a separate skill, is a separate skill, right? Most teaching most uh, introductory courses in, in uh, programming will uh, teach you problem solving via a language, but will not focus explicitly on the fact that, look, now I have this solution. I know how to sort a deck of cards, right? I know how to do it without the knowledge of a programming language. Uh, or I need, I, I know how to add two 10 digit numbers, right? And again, I need, I, I, I can do it without the aid of a programming language. It's an algorithm, it's a problem to which I have a solution. And once I have that solution, there is a need to express that solution into a language in order to have it solved by a computer. Um, so, um, uh, uh, right, there's a problem solving phase. And I think most of us are relatively well accustomed to uh, the problem solving phase. We know how to solve problems. There are modules that will teach you how to solve problems, right? The second part is uh, more complicated. And the way we learn that is by learning patterns. We pay attention to patterns, patterns of solutions in problem solving, right? And how each pattern can be expressed in a variety of languages. We can only learn the patterns by example. So the more experienced you are, the better you are. It's like that. There's no uh, you won't acquire the skill by simply reading a book. Um, and therefore, you have to be engaged in not active learning. Um, uh, you have to always look out for patterns in examples, right? You have to look every time you see a new example, so you have to try to compare it to examples that you have seen in history, to problems that you have seen in your history, right? And see whether, from, whether a pattern emerges from that. Um, and, and often, uh, you know, you have to do it till something clicks in your mind and you know that you have learned. And, and um, it's the aha moment that, that many people talk about, right? You know when you have it and you know that at that point you have acquired new knowledge. Um, my help can be in picking relevant examples and trying to emphasize the uh, patterns. But you know what? My explanations will hit, uh, with, will hit a wall if you don't practice all those things and you don't try to solve uh, new problems on your own. And uh, if that uh, aha moment hasn't happened yet, right, don't despair. Keep working. It will happen. It's how the brain works. It's the innate nature of the brain to accumulate knowledge. And it's largely, largely an unconscious process. You can't control when the knowledge will emerge, when the new knowledge will emerge. All you can do is keep doing it, keep practicing, right? And let the unconscious pr uh, part of the brain work on its own and <laughs> reach that aha moment, which you can't control. Uh, and, and if you think that some other people, the, the guy next to you is smarter than you, well, that's probably because he spent, in, in earlier in his, uh, in his time, in his history, he spent a lot of time solving these kind of examples, and he's just more experienced. Uh, 
right? There's a body of knowledge. There's a time he invested at an earlier point in his life in acquiring these patterns, right? And all you have to do is catch up, spend time practicing. All right. So, um, so um, what's a typical beginner's misconception in, uh, in, in dealing with programming languages? Where, where with many kinds of knowledge, as a matter of fact, um, many people think that they have to acquire the full knowledge before starting to program or to solve exercises or, or to do anything useful with that knowledge, uh, right? Many people think that I, I can't program in this language, Ruby, let's say, or Python or whatever, because I haven't been trained in Python. I have to read this whole book on Python first, and then I can start solving exercises. No, that's not true. The best way to learn anything is to decide on a project, to decide on an object, and to learn just that knowledge that helps you achieve that objective, right? Be focused. So decide on a programming uh, project and then start digging for information that will push you toward uh, completing that project. And you will be learning a lot, but guess what? That learning will reach a deeper, will, will give you a deeper level of understanding as compared to having acquired uh, that knowledge, knowledge solely by reading a book. And then you want to learn more, decide on a different project that is somewhat, somewhat orthogonal, requires different knowledge of that language, different kind of knowledge, knowledge and repeat the process. Acquire the knowledge till you, that, that, that pushes you towards uh, accomplishing your goal, right? And the important thing is to be persistent. Don't abandon your project. Keep going. Uh, and, and be absolutely sure that after a while, because this is how the brain works, you will naturally <laughs> become that experience will be reflected in your knowledge. You will have uh, a higher quality of knowledge. All right. Uh, practice, 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 already emphasized and probably uh, a very common sense advice, right? Programming is a skill. Skills are built with practice. It's like riding a bicycle or swimming. You can't read a book and then go and mount your bicycle and start riding. You will have to practice. You will have to fall down a few times, right? And uh, after a while, somehow, without you understanding exactly what happened, you're suddenly able to ride a bicycle, right? There's an aha moment happening there. It's more of a physical, you know, muscle memory kind of aha moment. But nevertheless, it's... It, uh, this kind of process uh, showcases very well how the brain works. Do it if you get it. Um, all right, so what do we want? What do we mean by practice? Well, try to solve the same problem in many ways that will allow you to build relationships. Try solving the same problem in many languages. We were talking about relationship with, relationships between languages. This is uh, what will uh, allow you to understand that. Uh, try to build an intuition about this relationship uh, in the process. Um, we will support this process by teaching uh, something we call translation schemes, and this will be emphasized over and over in this point, right? We want to understand how can we translate a program from a language into a different language. And we want to do that by in a systematic way. It's not like I'm giving you this factorial program in C, and now give me the factorial program in Python, because then it's as if you would write a completely new Python program. What we want to do is, looking at this program, find a systematic way that will uh, lead to, the, to, to a possibility of translating any C program into a Python program, right? Systematic. And then apply that, apply that to the process of translating factorial from C to Python, let's say. Um, all right, and uh, my feeling is that this will be probably one of the most useful things uh, you will learn in this uh, module. Um, all right, uh, remember, you have to, you're responsible for your own learning, right? I'm much less responsible for learning than you are. And uh, it would, with, with respect to this, if you want my help, you have to ask for it. So anytime you feel like there's things I can help you with, you have to voice 
your request. You have to come to me and tell me. You have to come into the forum and voice your doubt so I can reply to it. You have to arrange for a consultation uh, and, and so on. Right? You have to be active in your learning. Whenever so, uh, you have to try to clarify your doubt. You have to, to try to clarify what you don't understand. Narrow down what you don't understand because that will give me a better chance of addressing exactly your doubt. Um, so if you have a piece of code that doesn't work, bring it in and let's discuss that. If you have a doubt that is generic, right? Try to write down a piece of code that will showcase your doubt. You will say, probably, I'm expecting that this should happen, but look at this code. It's doing this, which for me it's unexpected. So then it would be a, a lot easier for me to explain what uh, you don't understand. All right. Um, another important thing is learning by association. It's, it's a very important aspect, and it um, uh, pertains to the fact that you don't have to have full knowledge of a topic to operate uh, within, within that realm. Uh, so let's look at a very common reasoning pattern here, right? So we have this expression, which is a C expression, and a possible translation of this uh, expression into assembly language is this one, right? And actually, you, you, you might be scared and say, well, this is assembly language, I don't know assembly language. Each of these instructions in a comment here has a C equivalent. So this first instruction performs a data transfer of the variable C into the internal register reg EAX. This second instruction performs D multiplied with the contents of DAX, keeping the result into this register DAX as well. The third instruction adds the value of, and this should be B, sorry for the typo, into to EAX, right? And finally, we store the, reg the register EAX into A, which is where we need to place the result right here, right? So just looking at the comments which, are, which have been given here, you can understand how the translation of this expression works. And then I might, add, might ask you, how do we translate this expression? Do you need to know fully you need to have full knowledge of assembly language. No, right? So looking at these lines, right, you will understand the kind of operations that we can perform at the level of assembly language. And we see that if we exchange these two lines, we would perform the operations in the right order, right? So uh, first we load C into the register, right? The second instruction now is this one, right? So we're adding B to that register. The third instruction is now, is this one, right? Is this one. So we're multiplying the register EAX with D, and finally the fourth instruction stores EAX into A, so performs this here, right? So the, re, re, the uh, answer here would be the same for instructions, but the second and third being exchanged. All right, and this is what we mean by learning by association, right? All the information that you need to solve this question is on this slide. You don't need to go to any books. All right, just look carefully and understand the differences between these two and create a similar difference between the given code here and what is supposed to be your answer. All right. And finally, so we have finished uh, the study tips. So uh, we can go now and talk about the programming language universe, which is actually what is covered in uh, today's uh, in today's uh, notes, right? So if you look here, the first um, lesson, 
which is what you get by clicking on this. Actually, it's uh, as we go to this site, it's the first page that appears, right? It talks about the programming language universe. Uh, we don't have that much time to talk about it during the lecture slot. Um, so I strongly suggest that you read the notes for more detailed information. Um, so one thing that I would like to draw attention to is uh, this diagram, to which I will refer at some point later. This shows the influences uh, in, in, the, in the evolution of uh, programming languages, right? Which language influence which? Uh, all right, so uh, there are a few things that are important to understand. Uh, it's always nice to know about the history. Uh, it's always not nice to know the trivia and uh, you know the anecdotes behind uh, the development of any science, not just you know, programming languages. But there are a few things that uh, we should understand, right? One is what drives, and, and one of those is what drives the development of programming languages. Um, and, and when I say that, I'm referring to non-technical information. There's one piece of non-technical information that we should understand, and that is. Uh, what drives the development of programming uh, languages. The other is uh, programming paradigms. <coughs> so the, the history is a bit of fluff that we will, um, that we will sort of um, skip under carpet. You're very welcome to read the notes for that. Um, so uh, we have two streams of development when it comes to development of programming languages. There's a commercial side. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk about the research side. The commercial side is the first one that emerged, right? Um, and it emerged because uh, of the need of uh, improving software productivity, um, right? So they usually have a simple execution mo model, a readable code, right? Because you want to be able to train programmers in, that, in those languages very quickly, very easily, at low cost, and, and get them uh, to a stage of being productive as, as quickly as possible. Um, they uh, often sp fill in a specific niche, um, like, for instance, SQL uh, is a very narrow, uh, narrow language, right? right? It, it, uh, it is used for database queries. Um, it, they want to be robust. They need to be robust. Uh, they need to uh, allow for modularity. They need to allow for reusability. And this all goes to a cheaper software development cycle. Um, um, all right. Uh, those who pick these languages and those who need um, this kind of um, uh, features in a language are not necessarily the programmers, are often the, the, the um, uh, project managers who are more concerned with um, the cost of development and the, the co cost of development cycle, right? Because you release version after version after version, right? And when you uh, work on version two, you would like to use and uh, reuse as much of the code of, of version one, and you would like to not inherit the bugs of the version one uh, and, and so on. Um, so, these features that are uh, placed here on this slide um, are meant to drive down the um, software development cost. Uh, the enduring paradigm that has emerged some 20 years ago and is very, still very present in uh, all uh, current programming language, languages, the commercial ones, is object orientation, right? Uh, no, there's no successful uh, language in practice nowadays without object-oriented um, object-oriented uh, features. There's a new driver on the market, customer loyalty. It started with Java, right? Commercial company creates a language, gives away the software development tools for free, and uh, then it hooks developers on, on those tools, and then it creates a new uh, array of services um, that uh, these uh, these customers, these, these developers would need further, right? So they create training, they create new sophisticated libraries, uh, and, and uh, they make money off those, right? And Java, from this perspective, has been a very successful um, enterprise, right? Um, it's, most of the basic development tools are 
uh, free, but then um, if you need training and if you need a variety of more sophisticated uh, libraries, you, those are um, that those cost money, right? So, so that's how some microsystems uh, used to make money. Uh, and uh, the model was successful enough that Microsoft copied it. So they came with their own uh, language and they created their own set of future features, many of which were released for free. But of course, the uh, to 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 create customer loyalty. But after that. There are a lot of services and, and um, products that uh, are uh, not free uh, and, and uh, a lot of companies make. All right, and, and this begs the question, is Java, are Java and C hash, C sharp, absolutely necessary? Are they, do we need both? And the answer is probably not, right? So whatever you can do in Java, you can also do in C sharp. Whatever you can do in C Sharp, you can do in Java. There's no serious difference between them, right? And it's just two big companies creating two competing products uh, and trying to divide the market and uh, 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 trying to, to make money. All right. Um, the other side of uh, development of programming languages is the research languages. These have emerged generally in uh, universities or research centers, uh, they uh, generally have novel ways of expressing computation, right? They have a much more complicated execution model. We'll see when we talk about Prolog. Prolog is, for instance, a language which is probably difficult to learn, but then a lot of uh, programs are going to write an interpreter in Prolog, right? You're going to see a 20 lines interpreter for a C-like language. Uh, something that if you ha would have to develop in C uh, would take hundreds of lines, right? So would be a tenfold increase in the development effort. Uh, so it's complicated execution model, right? But many complicated problems as a result of that get very straightforward solutions in these new paradigms. Uh, they, they usually are not developed to the point of being very optimized. And the, so the software development tools, because they are, they are developed in universities which have uh, fewer resources, right? Um, they don't get to be as sophisticated as commercial tools. Uh, so they are usually just useful for uh, proof of concept projects, right? In our interpreter in Prolog will showcase the fact that we can build an interpreter for a language but will not be the interpreter that you would want to use commercially. They're much slower because of lack of optimization, and they often have an elegant, puristic approach to programming. Uh, right, because of that, programmers have to be very smart, and uh, that is one uh, reason why they don't become widespread, because in practice, the average programmer um, is not necessarily the kind who would uh, be able to program in this kind of languages. Okay, um, there's a short history uh, and uh, in independent notes. I won't insist much uh, here because of time constraints. Um, all right, the driver for commercial languages uh, has been the power of the hardware and the software development needs. Um, and uh, the software development needs were, were, you know, the demand for software was uh, very high even in the 70s, right? And uh, most of the programming languages of the thousand that we were talking at the beginning of the lecture have uh, been uh, developed in the 70s because there was this high demand, which was much higher than the um, actual supply of software. Right, and people were trying very hard to make software much more productive, so then they could meet the demand. Uh, for research languages, the um, uh, the driver has been uh, a, a different a different kind of uh, uh, problem solving approach, let's say. Right, so people try to think, well, the next big challenge is artificial intelligence, and and actually. Um, the, these goals were higher and, and more um, 
more un unattain unattainable in, in the beginning, and they, then they narrowed down and became uh, more attainable, and actually some of them has, have, been, um, have been attained, right? So artificial intelligence is still a challenge, but in the 60s, 50s, and 60s, it seemed that this was the problem to solve. People figured out quite uh, quickly that uh, artificial intelligence as a whole is too big a challenge, so they narrowed down. They said, well, let's try to uh, teach the computer to reason logically. And later they said, oh, well, you know, logic given is, because logic is generally undecidable, logic isn't, is a too, much, too much of a challenge. Let's just focus on theorem proving in logic, not on general reasoning. Now let the uh, human state the theorems, let the computer prove the theorems, right? Then same for algebra, similar for algebra, constraint solving. So this is one problem that was solved. So an even smaller subset of logic is called constraints. And statements that can be expressed as constraints require an answer of whether they are true or false, right? So that problem was, to a great extent, solved. We're going to see a constraint solving uh, language in our point. Um, so this has been much of the driver. For instance, this has led to the language prologue. Um, uh, algebra led to the typed functional languages, uh, of which modern exponents are uh, OCaml and Haskell. Uh, constraint solving has led to a, an array of uh, paradigms, the most popular of which is constraint logic programming, known as CLP. Um, yeah. Uh, but these the drivers have been completely different. It's never been the question of whether anybody needs that language, but it has been uh, the question of showing or the 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 the, uh, the issue of show, showing that something can be done can be achieved. Right? I can do it. Why do you do it? Because I can. Right? You know this answer. <laughs> um, this funny answer. Uh, it's very much. Uh, what drives research in many areas, not just in programming languages. So uh, in commercial languages, this is sort of a history where each of these languages uh, were a milestone, oh, right? Each of these languages were a milestone because they brought in something important. Um, so Fortran was the first uh, high-level language. Algol was the first language to have um, uh, to have structured programming, to have while loops. COBOL was a language for businessmen, which was supposed to be easy to learn and was supposed to be as close to English as possible so that non-specialists uh, could, um, uh, could learn it and, and use it. C, portable assembly language, right? That was its initial role to lead to allow the writing of a portable operating system. They needed a language that uh, was as close to the assembly language as possible, yet could be implemented on as many architectures. ADA introduces con concurrency at the level of programming language. SQL, the first domain-specific language. C++, uh, well, it borrowed OOP from small -time talk, but is the language that brings object orientation into the mainstream. Java um, actually, you know, also was, was known initially as C minus minus, so it's stripped of C plus plus all the unsafe features. So it's the first language that becomes uh, for for large scale software development that is safe, doesn't pay so much attention to efficiency. Um, it's uh, it's safe, it's portable, and uh, it also has a security model that allows mobile code to be executed. In other ways, you can, in other words, you can uh, get a class from somewhere on the web in a, from a place that is potentially unsafe, bring it into your machine, inside your virtual machine, and execute it, and the virtual machine will look out for potentially unsafe operations and stop the running of that class if, um, if there's even a hint that the the uh, the code may try to harm the local machine. Um, there's a flurry of languages that appear in the 1990s. Uh, each of them are reactions to uh, something. It's pretty much like the the, the, the creators of these um, uh, languages didn't like 
everything else that was around, and they picked and choose from the existing languages in order to make something that they liked. Um, right, especially for Perl, Python, and Ruby. Ruby is not here. JavaScript is an embedded language that appears inside a browser, becomes very mainstream. PHP is an embedded language that, that, is, that uh, works in, on the server side, inside an, Apa an Apache server, and Visual Basic. Um, and, and they were landmarks in their uh, own right. They all of them became very popular languages. C Sharp, reaction to Java. Um, uh, from Microsoft, trying to copy the, uh, the model of uh, offering developer tools for free and then making money of more sophisticated services. And finally, Go. Which uh, again, uh, it, to a certain extent, is uh, uh, looks like the creator didn't like their languages and created a new language uh, to fit uh, his own purposes. It's remarkable because it has fine-grained concurrency in a compiled language, which is new for a commercial language. Right? This was available in research languages, but not not in a compiled language. Um, and uh, it's uh, Google is arguing that uh, it will be the language for programming um, clouds, uh, right? Cl computer clouds, and uh, its its features are targeted. But but on on uh, the on the flip side, it very much seems that they are copying the models of C sharp and Java, creating uh, trying to create some customer loyalty and later make some money off it. All right, research languages. The first research language, language was LISP, uh, which was targeted at solving artificial intelligence problems. So remember how we talked about the history, uh, right? Artificial intelligence problems was seen as the first big challenge in computers in 1960s and 1970s, right? And that, that big objective was narrowed down step by step in the decades to come. Uh, Prolog emerged later as for programming and logic. It's a very old language, all right? And uh, it has evolved a lot. So the version that you will see uh, in, in our lectures will not will be much more evolved than the one that uh, was put forth in uh, 1972. Smalltalk, first language to be object-oriented, right, and uh, exhibited. This is a puristic approach to object orientation, and we will see a similar puristic approach in Python and Ruby. Uh, later, we won't be discussing Smalltalk, uh, but it's a landmark, right? ML, it's typed functional language, so they take the list model of functional programming, but they add types to it. And uh, guess what was ML used for? For theorem proving, right? So one of the one of the um, objectives, <laughs> grand challenges of computer science. Um, and uh, it later uh, it later spawned uh, standard ML, right? An evolved variant of ML, and OCaml, which is a language that we are going to talk about. CLP put constraints into Prolog. All right, and in fact, the compilers of Prolog that I have recommended are actually CLP compilers. Constraints is just an added feature. Haskell takes functional programming and purifies it, makes it into algebraic programming. It's pretty much like writing mathematics. And an important feature here is laziness. So whenever we discuss laziness, lazy computing, we're going to use Haskell as a whole. Was all right, is a language that is multi-paradigm. So one thing that we're going to want to see here is how many multiple paradigms can live inside one language. And it's a language to have fine-grained concurrency. It's not the first one. The first one was Occam, a language called Occam. Um, but uh, in fine-grained efficiency, the way it is implemented in Oz is not very efficient, but it leads to a lot of interesting solutions to a lot of problems. So we want to experience that. We will see similar solutions in Go. Um, all these languages belong to uh, one of the following paradigms, all of which we're going to try to cover in this module at some point. Imperative programming is programming with assignment. It's programming where you say, tell the machine what to do, do this, then do that, then do that, right? And 
assignment is important for that. Languages that are imperative are C, um, uh, right? The the uh, coding part of m most object-oriented languages are also is also imperative, right? When you write uh, uh, the body of method to write imperative programming in C++ and Java. Another one, another paradigm is logic programming, which is prolog, functional programming, which is Lisp, uh, OCaml, Haskell, Scheme. Object-oriented programming is C++, uh, well, Smalltalk was the first one, right? C++, Java, C Sharp, uh, Python, Ruby have actually a puristic approach to object-oriented programming, though you don't necessarily see it up front. Constraint programming. Uh, it's, a, it's a separate paradigm, but the most popular incarnation of constraint programming is in conjunction with logic programming. So most often we see constraint logic programming systems. Event-driven programming are uh, uh, the, the, the programs of, of this paradigm um, are, have um, event handlers, right? So it's no, not, no, not a sequential execution of code, but whenever an event appears in the system, a certain procedure is automatically involved. Aspect-oriented programming, oh, this one is not covered. Uh, and it's, it's uh, quite interesting, and it may um, uh, warrant a, a, a bit of discussion. Unfortunately, there's no time for that, but uh, we may take it up point sometime if you're interested. Uh, go ahead and... Um, Ask me, or better, um, uh, find your own resources for aspect-oriented programming and post them in the forum for credit. And uh, many of these paradigmatic features are uh, orthogonal, and uh, therefore they can be combined in the same language. So, for instance, typing, uh, uh, typing, strictness, concurrency. You may have combinations of these in a variety of uh, languages without affecting each other, right? So you can have a typed, lazy, <laughs> finely concurrent language or any other combination of terms, right? Uh, there are also many uh, languages that try to combine imperative and functional. We'll see the example of Camel, for instance. We'll see the example of Ruby. Ruby is mainly imperative in its code writing but has functional features. OCaml is mainly functional in its code writing, but has imperative features and also has object-oriented features. Um, right? Even though they're not the mainstream, they're not the first thing you see in that language. Okay, and uh, this is it. So, uh, thanks for listening to this lecture, and see you next time.